Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Senecal, Chair of the Vermont Commission on Women, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining with the Commission tonight. It's wonderful so many people recognize the importance of talking about the status of women in Vermont and the disproportionate impact that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on them. Particularly hard hit are women of color. I see many familiar faces here tonight, so I want to take this opportunity to thank elected members of state government and the administration, folks from the many of our advisory organizations who have long been at the Commission's side, working toward economic equity and opportunity for all female identifying people in our state. For nearly 60 years, the Vermont Commission on Women staff and 16 appointed commissioners from around the state and when we're very fortunate as we are right now, incredible interns work tirelessly to improve the lives of women and girls in our state. The commission conducts research and provides data and analysis on issues affecting women in Vermont. And Carrie Brown, our executive director, is a familiar face to everyone at the state house as she regularly testifies in legislative committees. The Commission is a clearinghouse for important information to women and a source of guidance for women in Vermont attempting to navigate resources and support. But this evening is dedicated to the greatest challenge we currently face, the COVID-19 pandemic and the harm it has caused and continues to cause female identifying Vermonters. We have a fantastic panel discussion up next, which will be followed by a breakout session that will allow for a deeper dive into the issues facing specific regions of our state. Just a reminder that this event is being recorded this evening and will be available through the Women's Commission website. Uh, the breakout sessions will not be recorded. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the woman we are so fortunate to have leading VCW as our executive director, Carrie Brown. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to see everybody here. Welcome. I'm so pleased that you joined us. And I'm just thrilled at how many of you recognize that this is an incredibly important topic, that we need to be paying attention to what's going on for women in Vermont to know how Vermont is doing, and that you took some time out of your evening to come and hear from our panelists and to hear from each other to talk about what we can do to address equity in our response to COVID-19. We have a really wonderful panel for you tonight. We have three panelists who will share some of their expertise with you. They're all experts, they all have great experience, and they have different perspectives and different information to share with you. We'll spend some time talking with them, and then we'll have a little bit of time for audience questions before we go to our breakouts. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists to you. First up, we have Lisa Falcone. She's the Executive Director of Mercy Connections, which is a community-based multicultural economic and social justice agency, which provides opportunities for people to pursue their goals and achieve better lives. She's also a founder and senior advisor of Work Lab Innovations, a startup organization that is supporting communities across the country as they replicate and build sustainable workplace practices through employer networks. Lisa spent many previous years working in higher education and in business and industry workforce development. Our next panelist is one of our very newest BCW commissioners. We're so pleased to have her join our team. Kaya Morris is an engaging and award-winning trainer on issues of diversity, equity, and leadership. She currently serves as the Movement Politics Director for Rights and Democracy Vermont, a Sisters on the Planet Ambassador for Oxfam America, and an Advisory Council member for Emerge Vermont and Black Lives Matter Vermont. She served in the General Assembly as a state representative from 2014 to 2018, and she was the first African-American and person of color elected from Bennington County, and the second African-American woman to be elected to the legislature in Vermont history. She's recently authored Life Lessons and Lyrical Translations of My Soul, a book of poetry, and is currently filming a documentary on race in Vermont titled Color Lines in the Green Mountains with Longshot Productions. And our final panelist is Professor Stephanie Seguino. She's a professor of economics at the University of Vermont. Her work focuses on the economic institutions that lead to and perpetuate economic inequality. 
She contributes to research on macroeconomic policy tools for financing and promoting gender equality. She's a research associate at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a fellow of the Gund Institute for the Environment. And she works as an advisor or consultant to numerous international organizations. And she's also an accomplished photographer. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I have questions for you. So I uh, will start off talking about unemployment. VCW has been tracking the unemployment figures since the beginning of the pandemic. So we have seen that women represent a much higher percentage of those filing claims than men. The latest numbers from November tell us that of all the unemployment claims filed in Vermont, 73% of them were from women. And this is dramatically higher than the national rate, which is about 50-50. But if we dig down into those numbers a little bit, we uncover even more alarming news. So Kaya and Stephanie, can you tell us some more about what these numbers mean for Black, Indigenous, and women of color? And we'll go ahead and start with Kaya and then Stephanie, you can tell us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. And thank you for joining us today. I'm so glad to be able to be in this community. Before I come up real quickly, I just want to acknowledge that we are here gathered today on occupied Indigenous lands. Um, this land, which um, is also called Nakana by the Abenaki here in Vermont, um, and was also the home to the Mohican, just recognizing that this is their land and it is unceded territory. So um, with that in mind, this, this, this conversation has historical roots and it has components that we're going to need to tease out in order to find a pathway forward. What I saw most recently was um, numbers that came out on a national scale that was looking at the job losses for the month of de December. And in that data set, they found that 100% of the job losses that were not regained in other um, sectors, 100% of those were women. Even more chilling, this also had impacts for women of color as that was the group. So this is insane that this is happening nationally, but it's something that we can feel and we can see right here in Vermont, just as Carrie was introducing before. So what this means is that the pay gap disparities that existed, the disparities amongst um, churn for qualified employees, the folks that are falling behind that are from the most impacted sectors are going to fall even further behind. And we have a narrative that we love to hold. I'll talk about that again, I'm sure, later. This myth that there are no people of color in Vermont and there's just such few, few numbers that it's almost statistically insignificant. And we know that that's actually further from the truth, right? But within that mindset, it gives us an ability to create an invisibility for an entire workforce that is often pushed to the margins. And it is by design, the state that, that is dependent on a service culture to be invisible in those spaces. That has historical roots, but it has current consequences. So these women are one that, you know, you didn't see them necessarily in your office place, but perhaps they were the ones that were cooking the food at your child's school. Perhaps they were the ones that were changing the beds within the hotel systems that we still had open for a while there, right? As we go back and forth the travel bans. When we think about what that means for those within the healthcare sector, it's, it's pretty widespread and it's devastating. It sets us back even further. So when I think also about what are you supposed to do next, as, as the economy has constantly gone through this oscillation and a downward spiral in the last few years, I've seen women of color step out of the workforce to try to care for their children, but then also say, maybe this is the time that I'm gonna go back and get that higher education. Maybe this is the time I'll get that degree or that extra credentialing. Maybe this is the time I'll do more professional development. In our state system, we have some of the worst financial aid that's available for students of any age, both non-traditional and traditional students. So when you are already economically impoverished, how does one access education when you have to make a choice between that gap of financial aid and putting food on the table? This is a, a frightening time for our country and it's a frightening time for our state. And what we have one in three families that are food insecure here in Vermont due to COVID. So um, 
those unemployment losses have a, a great deal of weight that they carry. Thank you. Stephanie, what can you share with us? Thanks, Kaya, for that perspective and good to see you. Um, yeah, so I wanted to go back to what Kaya originally said that uh, at the national level, uh, 156,000 women lost their jobs in December and men gained 16,000 jobs. The Vermont disparity between men and women in the loss of jobs is actually the highest in the country. And this has to do with the fact that of, uh, the, the, is related to occupational segregation, the kinds of jobs that women can get. And, um, and so let me say this, that for, almost half of all job losses in December were in the services industry. And that really is, you know, uh, house cleaning, restaurants, home health aides, and so on and so forth. And that's where we see a lot of not only gender segregation, but racial segregation as well. And so what you're seeing is that it, in particular, women of color uh, are losing their jobs. We don't, we don't have great data, mostly for sample size issues. Although I wanted to reaffirm Kaya's point, 30,000 BIPOC folks live in Vermont. That's not a small number, uh, however you dice it. But for statistical reasons, it's not as easy to calculate the unemployment rate uh, by month in Vermont by race. But just nationally, what we find is that the black unemployment rate is usually double the white unemployment rate. And although the gap is narrow between white women and black women, uh, it is still very high. And so what this means is that uh, this is, Black women in Vermont, Hispanic women, and Asian women uh, have lower per capita income. Uh, they live in households with lower median income. So for a white household, the median income is $60,000, and for a Black family, it's $43,000. That means they have less savings, they have less wealth accumulation, and they're the least able to weather this economic stop storm. Uh, I'm trying to find my data. I made notes to myself, and it's not coming up uh, right away, but... Um, uh, one of the things that is actually, I just found it, uh, not only that, but housing ends up being in jeopardy as well. So amongst white families, 28% are renters, and amongst black families, 78% are renters and face eviction if they lose their job. Poverty rates um, may not surprise you that are almost double for black uh, and Hispanic families in Vermont than for white families. And so again, the resources that these families have to weather this crisis differ greatly by race. And although white women might lose their jobs, they tend to live in households with men who have higher earnings. And I'm not diminishing at all because single moms, whatever the race, have also deeply been affected by the crisis. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That's extremely helpful. Um, Lisa, you work with women whose employment has been directly affected by the pandemic, many of whom are at the lower end of the income scale. Can you share with us some of the challenges that they're facing that we may not be hearing about every day? Thanks, thanks, Carrie, for, for that question. And um, thanks to Kaya and Stephanie for setting this up so well. So I am going to take a very different perspective on, um, I'm not an economist and um, we have really been boots on the ground uh, these past 10 months or so through Mercy Connections working with uh, women. Um, and so my lens is definitely through, through that, that perspective. Um, I do want to let folks know that the women we're serving are women on re-entry coming out of prison and uh, um, women and some uh, for to reach their well-being, academics, job readiness, business ownership, and U.S. citizenship. Um, so when I think about this question and I think about, I went to the uh, public asset state of working Vermont report, which I think just came out this week. And one of the numbers that really struck me was that 100,000 Vermonters were out of work when COVID struck. And so what did we see and what were the challenges uh, right from the beginning? 
we knew that getting essentials to people, assisting with housing, and I think Stephanie just mentioned that, food, technology, and basic items were really of utmost concern. Uh, connecting people to resources, including things like unemployment and other essential benefits, um, was something that had to happen. And uh, fortunately, through Vermont, who I'm grateful that there has been um, some rallying around making sure benefits are available. Um, for people who don't speak English during this time, uh, and we have several people who um, don't speak English or have limited English, we were very concerned and worked with them around getting them good information. And that meant uh, making sure that they knew what the state guidelines meant when it said to stay in your houses. And, uh, and so that was very critical in the beginning. Um, I, I think the thing that I really want to stress here is that uh, COVID-19 has laid bare the gap. Between those with ample financial um, uh, a chasm, if you will, between the two. Um, so those are some of the biggest issues we're facing. Um, instability, uncertainty, increased anxiety are all things that are impacting women um, and low-income people in a way that uh, right now the focus is, sent, is still on the here and now. How do I survive today? And I think that, as Stephanie said, is going to have a huge impact as we move forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, you talked some about the, the, the jobs or lack of jobs that were present before the pandemic and how things have really been exacerbated by the pandemic. And you know, one of the things that we're seeing is women are really facing a double whammy of being more likely to hold the jobs that were lost to the pandemic, such as food service and retail. Um, we know that 81% of the tipped wage workers in Vermont are women, huge percentage. And they're also more likely to be the ones holding the jobs that we now call essential, such as childcare and healthcare. So Kaya and Lisa, both of you, I wonder if you can talk about how you're seeing this kind of dynamic play out for women in Vermont. Kaya, you want to start? Sure. So I, I appreciate this question. And I also want to lift into the space as well, thinking about what this means for our um, migrant women, our undocumented women, who um, are this also really key source of our workforce and um, trying to access systems when we recognize that the inability to get access to the recovery stimulus funds were denied to them if not for action through the state to be able to make that possible for individuals. Um, the, the opportunities to advocate for oneself when you don't have health care, um, the opportunity to feel like you have a voice when we already recognize that exploited labor is a, a part of our workforce. It is a part of how our economy functions. Um, so that's something that I think um, we need to also do some deep digging around and need to have a, a much clearer understanding of those impacts as well when we think about how this is impacting women in the workforce. Um, what's interesting to me in this point in time, and I think what I want to lift, um, out of this particular point in the conversation is that we are seeing now the rollout of the vaccine. And this brings hope for some and it brings anxiety for others. It requires an extra dose of faith and um, a suppression of the fear that many women of color have earned, have held. It's been well-earned mistreatment um, and a, a, an inability to trust our healthcare systems because of we have a historical violence of forced sterilization, of experimental um, treatments being used without consent. And so there is a, a fear that many have about something that's brand new, but we know that it's necessary in order to work. And we also don't want to have our families impacted, but we're struggling with how to wrestle with all of those pieces. So women of color and, and especially black women as well, if we are to express these symptoms, once we do get these vaccines, historically, currently, there are distinct disparities in health treatment and whether or not black women and women of color are believed for their symptoms. So even if there were to be challenges with this, 
are we going to be safe? Are we going to be protected when we know we need this to be able to return to a workforce or to create an economy that will not have to rely on remote work in order to sustain itself? So this is um, an abnormal ask in some ways. And I think of the manager as well of a, a grocery store. It was a friend of mine who um, was, a, it was a retail grocery store, but so many people were struggling with the early commands and the early um, determinations from the state that we needed to have masks in public spaces. And so for those early days in the pandemic, this mother was forced to have to stay at home, isolated from her own child, quarantined from her own child in order to continue making a living. And the stress that she was carrying every day. I mean, recognize that we get retail racism all the time. So for workers that are in hostile workplaces, that was their to the pandemic and if they are then to again assert I need for you to follow social distancing rules or to please take care of the guidelines wear a mask please be thoughtful about these things they are met with hostility and a threat of violence that they should not have to endure in addition to the other things that they're carrying into this work so I, I know that that seems it, it seems like a, maybe a, a a, a step away from where we were thinking about with this question originally, but what it means to be able to work or to not work in the midst of a pandemic, and particularly if we hold an identity that is that of a BIPOC person, of a woman of color, that there are extra layers that one must endure in order to be able to be present in the workforce right now. Yeah, thank you, Kaya. I really appreciate that perspective. And that's um... Those, those interlocking layers are so important for us to, to consider and they can really end up with different results than um, if we're only considering one of those at a time. Lisa, what can you share with us? So first I wanna say, can we please celebrate that we are calling these workers essential workers, not frontline, entry level, low wage, but essential workers. So it really speaks to the fact for me that there is value in work, in jobs. And uh, we, just by calling folks different names, um, we sometimes devalue the work they're doing. So, so yay, essential workers, I, I'm, it's now my new favorite way of describing work. Um, and, and, and certainly, so many women who have who have carried these jobs. It's you know we we've just always thought of them as low wage work. Um, you know my you mentioned Carrie that my background is really workforce development and I worked doing working bridges before I came to Mercy Connections, and that model that workforce sustainable model had some genius behind it, and that was the fact that it recognized an intersection of work and people's lives, um, and so. Here, what we're seeing with many, many women as things have opened up and people have been called back to work, um, they're faced with all kinds of issues, you know, issues that we're all faced with, but they are childcare. They're concerns about their own health and safety, um, exposing families to um, the virus if they go to work, teachers, uh, people who work in senior living homes, those kind of jobs, um, all, most of them women's work. Um, many of us, me included, and, and my staff, even though we are doing direct service, we're mostly working remotely. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're able to continue to do this work without exposure. Um, and and I, I think that, and with the ability to balance our lives. So as hard as, you know, if you're sitting there going, okay, I have teenagers working on homework and, there's, there is there is a difference. There is definitely a difference. Um, for many people, it has been a struggle. And I, I'm just going to talk about one story that, that stuck with me from the very beginning when the pandemic started. And uh, again, thinking about the intersection of work. Uh, this happens to be a man. I, I, I realized that as I as I wrote, as I made notes about this, but this person um, uh, was called back to work. 
uh, in a senior living home and didn't have any, uh, did not have personal transportation and wanted to take, um, did not want to take a bus in the early days. So the work was finding this person a bicycle so uh, he could continue to get to his work and his job. And um, those are the kind of issues that we sometimes just take for granted when we think about work and, um, and particularly as it relates to essential workers. There are a million stories. Um, my staff would be uh, uh, mad at me if I didn't mention that most people are working more than one job to, to meet their basic needs. And I just want to remind people of that that's not really a sustainable way. Um, and they've lost one or more jobs. So, so right now, household income is really stretched and we are definitely seeing that. And I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so one of the themes that comes up over and over again, you've all touched on it, is uh, how the pandemic has really shown us the some of the structural inequities that we were facing that were already in place before. And in some cases, this has made them even worse. And one of those areas where we've seen inequity forever is in the care responsibilities for family members and taking care of household labor, which has fallen disproportionately on women's shoulders and has a huge impact on their ability to make a living and the kind of their workforce participation. And Stephanie, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit more about what impact we've seen on the care burden for women from the pandemic and how that is playing out. Yeah. Um, you know, I think for me, one of the most telling um, things that I've seen was a survey that was done uh, in which men were asked about, you know, how much they were contributing. And in the survey, 50% of all men said that they do most of the homeschooling and 3% of their wives agreed with them. Uh, and I, you know, I think it, it speaks to the fact that, you know, men, some men have stepped up during this period of time. Uh, but I, I just saw some research the other day that said that this was true maybe in April and May, but people have reverted back to their original gender roles. And one of the gender roles that I'm sure you all are aware of is the emotional work that women do. Uh, and this is a time of great family stress. So not in addition to the homeschooling, in addition to trying to work remotely, in addition to low-income families trying to put food on the table, they are also managing this emotional burden uh, of their families. And, uh, you know, I just say that, you know, I have forever seen that women are incredibly strong and resilient and in some ways it's, you know, they're, they're, it, it ends up, they pay a cost for that. Uh, that they, um, they are the ones that are turned to during times of crisis in their families around this care work. I think it also speaks to the fact that gender roles don't change that quickly. Uh, and even though you saw this temporary bump in male performance of care work during the crisis, that uh, it, it pretty much evaporated and uh, things returned to the status quo. And so one of the effects of this is what we're seeing is that women are leaving the labor force. Uh, and I want to just, if I might just share something with you, because I think it's important for you all to be able to read the data well. Um, people are only counted as unemployed if they say they were actively looking for work in the previous week. And, uh, and so for many women, they have withdrawn from the labor force, uh, largely because of care responsibilities. And uh, so I, this is a form of hidden unemployment. And I would just say to you that uh, if you're really trying to understand what's happening in terms of women's access to income, which I want to just say that this group knows more than others, but it's fundamental for women to be able to have bargaining power within the family and to leave abusive relationships should the need arise. Uh, and uh, so they, they, their lack of that income has a, an important impact on family dynamics. Um, and so what we're seeing is that a lot of women are leaving the labor force. There's been a pretty substantial decline in women leaving the labor force. And it's not so much that women were uh, voluntarily leaving as that they were, sh they were uh, shoved out of the labor force because of shuttered schools, because of lack of 
childcare, because of pay disparities, because of lack of public transportation, because of lack of public policy that supports women in their care responsibilities. And one that I, I also want to mention that I think is fundamentally important to the legislators here is that any cuts in government spending disproportionately affect women, not only on the service side, but because women are disproportionately employed in government sector jobs. So all of those things, both the increased care work at home and, and which women, you know, I think were they able to stay in their jobs would continue to take on and juggle, but uh, it, you know, many are in fact not able to take their jobs on. And as I said, just to repeat, the decline in women's labor force participation is not uh, necessarily do is not necessarily voluntary. Uh, uh, it is a lot of it has to do with care responsibilities. So we're asking women to choose between financial independence and being able to support themselves or care of their children. And that's really the, I think the drama of the lives of many women. And I, 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 we can't fail to mention the class dimensions of this. People like me that have a professional job that work, uh, that, you know, that I can easily work remotely. I can easily afford somebody to do care work in my home. Uh, does well, but think of the single mother who has these care burdens, has lost her job, uh, has maybe get a, gotten unemployment insurance, but is managing, uh, and, and many times uh, if they stay in their jobs or are dealing with inflexible employers with regard to their care responsibilities at home. The, the, their lives are not diminished just because of the economic effects, but the extraordinary, extraordinary stress on the families and as a result of this on their children, have long-term negative effects on the family's emotional health. And in particular, there's demonstrated evidence of the negative effects on children's brain development because of this family stress and because of the financial stress that we are gonna be paying for long in the future if we don't address that. Thank you, Stephanie. I really appreciate that. This is one of the things that um, has gotten me the most disturbed looking at the numbers of women who are leaving the workforce that and that the rate of women leaving entirely is four times the rate of men leaving the workforce. And, and they're not counted in those unemployment numbers, which are stark enough to begin with. And I'm, it, uh, I'm worried that we are going to see decades of progress undone practically overnight. You know, one, one bad event comes along, not that the pandemic is a small event, but to, to undo years and years and years of progress for women is really speaks to the, the deeply entrenched ideas we have about who is supposed to be taking care of family and who is supposed to be going out and earning money at an outside job. Do you mind if I add, Carrie, sure. to that? And it's also yes. the fit yes. of policy, that public policy that address these needs in terms of care, that, uh, that socialized care or created mechanisms for men to take on more responsibility wouldn't have meant that there was a gender component to this, but there is a, a deep failure of public policy. Thank you. I wanna make sure that we have some time for some questions. Um, I also do uh, your last point, Stephanie, about public policy and failures or successes thereof um, is something that I hope that we'll be able to get into a little bit, bit more with our discussion as well as in the breakout rooms. Um, but uh, let's take a few minutes for questions. And I think if you can, if folks have questions, they can raise their hands, use the raise hand feature in Zoom and I'll be able to see you and unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay, Emma Mulvaney Stanek. Great, I get to be the first one. Yes, Hi everyone. You thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm so glad my kid has decided to stop Zoom bombing me. Um, <laughs> she was listening actually, which is really great. You know, start them young. Uh, so I don't know if my question is specific to Stephanie. I'm a newly elected um, state representative and I have found myself on the Commerce Committee, which will be addressing unemployment, hopefully with a very fierce lens uh, centering women and BIPOC folks. Um, I'm certainly committed to doing that. I am curious, you know, the data limitations that, that state agencies often come into committee rooms around and say, well, we just don't collect that or we can't collect that or whatever they try to kind of shut down the conversation. I'm really curious, um, 
you know, these numbers are very stark around unemployment in particular, but the hidden unemployment piece, and Stephanie, I don't know if you can speak to this, is there any way that we can cast more light onto that or encourage them to cut numbers differently to kind of paint the broader picture about the hidden number of women in particular and probably gender non-binary folks out there who are um, unemployed as well, but they're not being counted. So the, the starkness is so much more um, real. And so I'm just curious, maybe a little coaching um, for how to bring some of that kind of um, framing into conversations because this, this is coming up very soon in our, in our committee. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think the best, at times like this, the best thing to look at is not the unemployment rate, but the employment rate. Um, I would just say that that's probably the best way because the people who are uh, discouraged workers that have stopped looking uh, aren't captured. I will say that, you know, it's it's useful. The, the I, hope, I hope I'm not being a wonk, but I can't help it. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics actually has a, an unemployment rate that captures uh, people who are involuntarily part-time employed and discouraged workers. And it's uh, called the U6 unemployment rate. And you can actually get that for Vermont. I actually got it from one of my former students who's at the Department of Labor. Uh, and that's, that's a really good measure as well. Uh, I, would, I would say the, those two approaches to that would be good. Thanks. Um, next, we have Caroline Person. She's got a question. I actually don't have a question. I have a comment. Would this okay? Hello. Oh, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Sorry. Would this be the appropriate time if I had a comment, not a question? Sure. Okay, um, so I'm just listening in and I'm basically one of the folks that you kind of describing. <laughs> so I thought maybe I could just kind of run down if, if this was an appropriate time again, uh, to just let you know my experience as a single mother with COVID. I mean, not having COVID, but with the experience of COVID and handling everything that you're discussing. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're okay. actually going to have time in the, in our breakout rooms. To in do the that. breakout. That's what I wasn't yeah. sure. That's why I figured yeah. if I should just wait. Okay. Okay. Because be I Thank was, you. I'm cooking dinner, so I kind of might have missed that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Okay. One so of the I'll hold soon. off until, yeah, exactly. That's why I'm <laughs> not uh, visual, <laughs> not doing a cooking show tonight. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll just wait till breakout then. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Vera, you have a question. Oh, you're having trouble. Un oh, sorry, sorry. It's my, my fault. I'm muting you. Okay, thank you, Karen. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. It's, it's a thrill to see so many of you here. It's really a thrill, especially the newer legislators and hey, Sarita out there. I wanna encourage all of you who are in the legislature or on the commission or in any position to speak with Mac Burowitz from the Department of Labor to request yet again that any data, any data requested by the state of Vermont be disaggregated by gender and race because all of this hidden stuff need not be hidden but they tell me the legislature needs to request it. Honestly, 20 years of this stuff and still that's the answer. So um, I'm thrilled to hear so many people paying attention to this. Um, and my question is only whether legislators in appropriations think there is any way to target funds specifically toward women who are caught in the middle as single parents and caregivers to elders and having lost these jobs that while we may be thrilled to call them essential are still very low paying. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that there are folks out there who are wondering whether COVID funds can be targeted specifically to the population we're concerned about tonight.
Do any of our panelists want to address that? Or you can also discuss that in the breakout rooms. Well, I appreciate that. I think one of the things that um, to recognize what happens when we aren't collecting that disaggregated data is that we not only lose lose track of the disparities, we lose track of the stories, we lose track of the churn of folks that are coming in and out. Um, we lose track of our modest gains, if we had any that we could show, right, for certain sectors of our population and for certain constituencies. But we also lose track of the impact that it has on families for that level of disruption to happen in their lives. Um, so I think it's, it's incredibly, incredibly important to think about that. Um, if I was also going to make an ask as a, a citizen myself, as a mom, as a working mom. Um, we also need to think about labor standards and what's happening, those that are working remotely right now. Um, sometimes they're working 12, 14 hour days with very few breaks because the Zoom life enables for us to not even think about standard breaks in the day, like we would think about in a normal office setting or perhaps in other workforce environments. But um, so we hear from moms that they miss their children and they don't get to see mm -hmm. their children. So um, that may or not be captured in the data in the way that you need, but it's an important part of why women are also leaving the workforce. Thanks. Okay, we have a question from Wichi R2. Hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. It, you did, thank you. Um, did. First of all, I just really wanna appreciate all the work y'all are doing um, and being able to bring these stories and, and share it with us. Um, I just have, uh, I, I'm with the BIPOC Health Justice Committee um, in the Brattleboro area. And I just wanted, um, because, you know, quantitative data is always helpful um, in making our cases. And I was wondering if you can restate um, how much the percent of the, because you said 73% of unemployment violence in Vermont were women. I was, and you said that there was a big number of those women being women of color or something like that. And I was wondering if you could restate the statistic. Yeah, Kaya, can you speak to that? Thank you. No, I actually don't have that Sorry, um, of women of color. I don't have that number, um, but I believe Stephanie actually spoke to that. Yeah, I don't have the Vermont specific numbers. I have like national oh. unemployment rates. Um, yeah, well, you know, sadly that, and and I, you should contact Matt Barowitz again at Department of Labor because actually he may be able to give that to you, but it's not something that I can easily find on a website. And, and so sometimes, you know, what I do is I'll go to the national data because Vermont is no different than the rest of the country and the kind of job segregation that we have uh, in disparities. And the national data can tell us a story that inform what's happening here. Thank you. And I did see someone threw into the chat a question around that. Um, so I was speaking with regards to national numbers, but I thought you were looking for statewide numbers, Witchy, so I apologize. Um, right. I, yeah, I don't think we have the statewide numbers anywhere. <laughs> oh, okay, our next question, uh, Representative Kornheiser. Thanks. It's really nice to be here with everyone tonight. Um, this is a little bit of an announcement. Um, regarding folks who are interested in the data side of this and the lack of good data that we have disaggregated. Um, we passed into law last year a requirement to expand the data that we collect um, to better tell the story of BIPOC Vermonters. And we are having um, a public hearing and then a public workshop over the next month um, to collect more information on how to do that well. And we'll be sending out the announcement in the next day or two. So. For everyone who is interested in that tonight, please stay tuned. We'll make sure to send it to the commission so that they can send it out through their wonderful media channels. Thanks. Great. We will absolutely do that. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. So let's go to Tanya Kristen. Hi, everyone. Um, first, thank you for the panelists' um, just comments and, and input and insight. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess I, this is a question in a way, but um, I work, I'm the executive director of Green Mountain United Way and one of our programs is Working Bridges, which Lisa Falcone um, spoke to briefly. And of course, what we are seeing right now in that program is just the incredible rise of um, women that are currently working, but their their needs that are, that are steadily increasing. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if the panelists see an opportunity to 
not only elevate the, the data of what is not working and what is not being su successful right now, but also that that is working and how we can really move that forward, um, particularly with, with new representatives here on this, you know, on this call of how we can really initiate and move forward what we see as successful work because it is happening. Um, and what we are learning, particularly as women leaders in the nonprofit and caring sector of what we know can be, you know, effective change to really address these 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 areas of crisis more effectively. Thank you. Can I ask you, Tanya, when you say what what positive things are happening, are you referring to jobs or, you know, can you give me an example of what you're thinking of? Sorry, I have to unmute her again. Thank you. Thank you for unmuting me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so actually on the ground, you know, I don't want to use the word program, but really, you know, one-on-one -on -one client facing work when you are dealing with the individual situations or, you know, what we're seeing in the workforce right now of um, how we care for women that are struggling, that are currently working and the, the ever-changing um, landscape that they're faced with, whether it's a partner or, or whoever, a change in the income in the household. Um, but also the single mom that is now addressing substantial issues regarding childcare, um, you know, need for heating assistance. It's, I guess I would, I would love to be able to take you on a tour of a day in the life of a working bridges resource coordinator and um, people that are working directly with people and how you really initiate effective change starting with one person, but learning from that and moving it towards larger system, system changes within the workplace, informing that employer of, these are the issues that are facing your, your employees right now, particularly women. If you want to secure essential workforce um, people, particularly nurses and those essential workers in, in hospital settings, this is what you need to really provide to them, whether it's childcare or an, a clear understanding of what that benefits cliff really means, because that benefits cliff is real and true, particularly for those low to mid-wage workers. Does that help? Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I work more at the macro level than the micro level. And I, I'll just say that there are things that we've done that have been very, very successful. Paid sick leave that we fought for for three years is mm -hmm. fundamentally important. Um, it's limited, however, in this environment. Uh, so uh, ensuring that women don't have to go to work in unsafe conditions, that they can say no to their bosses, for example, uh, or have some, you know, backstop uh, to be able to advocate for themselves is important. Um, I would say that, you know, one of the things we've learned with the uh, additional unemployment paychecks of $600 a week is that it had tremendous effects on hunger. That is, it improved hunger and it, it, it had enormously beneficial effects for family well-being. And it should teach us that that's where we need to go, that allow it, you know, forcing people to work in minimum wage jobs that are actually below the, the real poverty level is, is, not, is, 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 um, is not right. Uh, beyond its economic effects, it also has long run costs. And so the, uh, the, the additional unemployment insurance, paid sick leave, we do fortunately in Vermont have a good uh, medical care in terms of Dr. Dinosaur and Medicaid so we're fortunate that those kind of supports work. And, and the reality is that all of those public policy supports have a tremendous effect because in labor markets, women are disadvantaged and employers have increased their bargaining power substantially in recent years so that women are not earning a living wage and ni neither are men, even if they were fully employed. And so the social safety net is really fundamental. And some of the ones I've mentioned have been very powerful in the way that they've worked. In terms of you know, um, policies or efforts to get employers to understand the condition of women, that's a harder sell. Um, and I, I would say that in many cases, um, some of the stuff that I have seen is that, it, I'll actually tell you about a, a woman who I got a taxi ride from on the way to the airport in Burlington, uh, was a Sede who was a Sedexa worker in the mail, meal services area. She told her employer that she, she only needed uh, she, to, to be uh, out of work at 7 p.m. so that she could feed her kid. And uh, she could come back to work at eight, she told him. 
And he said, no way, and she lost her job. I, I think that anything that forces a woman to choose between the well-being of her child and a living is something that we have to, we have to address fundamentally. Roughly, I, I would say 25% of all of Vermont children live with single moms. And so we are seeing not only the effects on moms, but the, uh, I see it as I work as a GAL and I see it in terms of the impact on kids. So I, I would say that, you know, moving in that direction would be really important. Hey, Stephanie, I'd love to talk to you more just about the Working Bridges program and how we, we carry those conversations with employers. So. That would be great. I would love that. Thank you. Well, I hate to cut off this conversation because it's so great. And unfortunately, we still have people who are hoping to ask questions, but we just run out of time. So I will say if you have questions that don't get answered tonight in the breakout rooms or elsewhere, you can email them to us and we'll see what we can do to try to pass them on and get some answers for you. So now we have some time to go into our breakout rooms and um, we'll spend a few minutes there, have some time for discussion, and then we'll come back, have a quick sharing out of what happened in those rooms and then we will wrap it up. Thank you so much to our panelists. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being here and the information that you shared with us. And I look forward to the discussions in the breakout rooms. Thanks. Are we all back? I think everyone's back now. Welcome back. That was an incredibly short amount of time, wasn't it? I can't believe how quickly that went. Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, we have just a few minutes to kind of do a little debrief and a little sharing out. If you have some highlights that you want to share with us from your discussions, um, that would be great. So we'll just, I, I would love to hear from the commissioners who were in those rooms. If there's kind of one point that you wanna share with us, that would be great. And you can just speak up yourselves or, or I'll call on you if you're not quick enough. Gary, this is Kelly, I'll, I'll go briefly. Um, okay. I'll just, uh, the quick, quick, quick overview. Uh, we talked briefly about health insurance, which I thought was a great conversation. Um, and kind of the concept of thinking about how we decouple that from employment. Um, there were some good points from a policy perspective about how challenging that can be for a small state. Um, and hopefully that there could be some federal partners that come to the table. Um, but just really thinking about how critical health insurance and access to health insurance has been through this pandemic. Um, so we discussed that. I'll say the other thing, which just of course it blows me away with a group like this, just the optimism in the room and um, that we have a real opportunity, maybe like we never have before, that there's a our communities recognize a lot. And I think it's really, um, we've been forced to think about what we truly value, um, that this experience and this, this horrible pandemic has uh, brought a lot of realization. And so as we build back programs and systems, um, think about groups that have been most marginalized, that we have a real opportunity to not just look at the next year, but really the next five to 10 years and um, reposition things differently and to not lose this opportunity um, as we're going through it. And then I'll, I'll just close with saying we had um, one member of our community who joined us tonight who just uh, kind of sh shared their lived reality, um, somebody who works in retail and the fact that um, they're probably, they're, they're making the best income um, now through this pandemic than ever because there's been a real understanding of the value of that work um, and how sad it is that it took a pandemic to, to bring that to light. So thanks to my group for sharing. We could have talked a lot more, but that was some highlights. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Carrie, this is Lisa, I'll go next. Um, yeah, Great. I was with the um, Northeast Kingdom group and we went in a lot of different directions but but I think a really important point and and important for legislators um, on this call to hear is just um, how how very different the Northeast Kingdom is uh, than most other regions of the state and that um, oftentimes when solutions are are being worked on um, they're are you know, Chittenden County, Washington County, other more populated areas that don't have the transportation issues or just so many of the other unique things to the Northeast Kingdom um, so that, that solutions that are tested um, and with the idea that they're going to be rolled out statewide, um, 
that there has to be a constant thought about those unique challenges of the Northeast Kingdom because what, what is going to work in Montpelier is not going to work um, in, in that part of our state. Um, and uh, the issue of, um, we've, we've talked about this some, that COVID, COVID didn't create any of these problems that exposed all of these problems and, and they're just laid bare in a way that people haven't uh, been able or willing to acknowledge them in the past. And now we're all, uh, we're all facing this in a, a more dramatic way because of the pandemic. Um, but the, the, the state college uh, issue is also um, really harming the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge employer um, and it's, it's also the, because there isn't the ability to, um, to go to other regions of the state uh, for education, those state colleges are incredibly important, both to the economy and to educating that region. Thank you, Lisa. Carrie, I'm happy to jump in. Great, um, thank you, Kim. Our group talked a, a fair amount, a nice mix of, you know, really looking into the role of the employers to be able to meet needs. We got into a little bit of a, um, a deeper dive into the idea of staggered work schedules to meet employment, employer needs, employee needs. Uh, we talked about some local examples of success and that was that's where the optimism came in we had a you know kelly ours was a mix of optimism and pessimism probably i brought the latter um and we talked to you know the role of employers was also a mix not just the leaders and ceos making decisions but how culturally uh, i had mentioned bringing hr in and how do you bridge the gap between leaders and stakeholders and frontline workers and needs and getting it communicated, whether it's just ignorance and not knowing certain needs or really starting to chip away at some of the obstacles. Um, we talked a little bit also about women owned businesses and if there was any difference that we've been seeing in those examples. Um, that's the gist. And I think we could have talked till about midnight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which dialogue and area for us to dive into. Thank you, Kim. I think that's true for all of our groups. Yeah. Hi, Carrie. This is Heidi. I'm happy to um, report from our uh, Central Vermont group. Um, we, uh, we heard um, about some of the work that um, the legislature is going to be undertaking in child care, um, which is such a critical piece of this. Um, we also heard um, uh, and, and we're fortunate to have Interim Corrections Commissioner uh, Jim Baker in our committee, and he talked about the impacts um, on some of the most vulnerable and, um, and brought up something that I think we really haven't touched on, um, and, and we could spend a, a, a whole other um, day and, and much longer talking about it, but the impact of addiction during this pandemic um, and what that's done uh, for, for many women and communities and families. Um, and, uh, and we had some, opt but we had some optimism in our group as well. And, uh, Tanya, Kristen urging us, um, uh, similarly, um, uh, um, Kelly to your group, um, to, to look for the opportunities that exist and, um, and to really keep pushing for change. So. Thank you, Heidi. Hey, right, this is Lisa Ryan. I'm happy to report out. Thank you. So um, we, we talked um, quite a bit about just uh, stress and mental health and, and healthcare emergencies and how COVID has um, exacerbated that for some individuals. Um, also talking about the really tough balancing act between family and kids versus working and having to choose and being put in those situations. Um, you know, self-care and employment. Uh, we also talked about how vulnerable uh, small businesses are right now in general and, and um, you know, folks who, who might be consultants or in, and do things part-time and, and the vulnerability that, that they're dealing with right now um, in the pandemic. And um, as we were wrapping up, we got 
we, we got into and, and started about, you know, um, the disabilities community and people who um, are disabled and what that is like for them and, and the importance of making space for, for families who are really fragile. Thank you. Is that all the groups or is there one left? Sarah Mel here. I'm left. Oh, great. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Um, our group, uh, I think similar to others, um, optimism and pessimism in equal measure, uh, we spoke a, a good deal about the, the livable wage um, work that has been done in the state and, and its need to move forward beyond the notion that $15 is, is livable. Um, which maybe when we began that campaign, it was, but um, is no longer. Uh, so really moving that number up and continuing to press for that um, across the state. Uh, we also spoke about um, the notion of, of balancing business, women-owned businesses, uh, those women being faced with choices about their business, their well-being, and their families, uh, and that for our homeschool population, for example, uh, an example that was given was homeschool folks made a choice to homeschool um, prior to this pandemic. Uh, what everyone else is facing is crisis schooling. Uh, it was not a choice, it was a choice thrust upon them. And in fact, even our homeschool communities are, uh, are asked to be schooling in a new way at home and the impact that that's having predominantly on women and the particular impact on women who own small businesses. Um, we really dug into this notion of this data vacuum across the state and the impacts of that vacuum on our ability to pass legislation and to do policy work that really does have the intended impacts that we want, which is to uplift um, the, the experiences of our BIPOC women uh, and gender nonconforming communities. And uh, where that landed us, kind of the, the optimism side of that was that while we might be small in numbers in the state of Vermont, which means that nationally, the data that comes out about us and that we gather internally is, is far from what we need it to be. And we do need to continue to push in all of the ways. Uh, the example was the Racial, racial Justice Alliance's push for um, data about the impacts of COVID on the BIPOC community in the state of Vermont and just how hard they had to push to get access to that data, but they did eventually get that data. Um, and we need to continue to, doing that, to do that work. But that be, our benefit is that we are a small state that can share stories so much more easily than if we were a large, larger in numbers. And so really highlighting the ways that storytelling in our state has had an, a massive impact on policy and legislation. Um, so really recognizing all of us as storytellers and, um, and that if we do this in a collective way, if we find collective, uh, we will find collective liberation in that. One, for the legislators on the call, one uh, piece we really wanted to highlight that was highlighted for us in our, in our small group was the changes made to the unemployment insurance qualifications have been absolutely impactful um, for uh, women across the state. And that uh, that is currently at the will of the, we believe the labor department, we're not sure. Um, and, but how important it is to keep that um, those unemployment insurance qualifications consistent uh, so that folks can continue to access the financial supports that they need um, during this pandemic and beyond. And I think that kind of covered it. If I missed anything, I do hope that folks will share in the chat. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for um, the fantastic discussions you had in your breakout sessions. And as I said earlier, if you have questions or, or things that you want to tell us that didn't come out tonight, uh, please email us and please let us know because we really just barely scratched the surface of all of this. Uh, thank you all so much. And I will turn it back over to our chair, Lisa. Oh, you're muted, Lisa. <laughs> I was being so good and finally meeting myself. Um, I just wanted to echo what you had just said about um, contacting the commission because there, I know there was a lot of information we talked about in our group that I didn't have time to report out. I'm sure there are other pieces um, that the other commissioners didn't report out. Please everyone know that the notes that we took um, were not just to report out, but we're actually going to be consolidating those notes and, and we'll use the information we got, but please keep the information uh, coming to us. This, this wasn't uh, intended to be a one-night 
uh, conversation. We want that conversation to be ongoing. So thank you so much for joining us and being willing to spend more time on Zoom. I know we're already all doing a lot of that. Um, thanks to our panelists, our room moderators um, and facilitators and everybody uh, for the, the fantastic conversation that we were able to have tonight. Uh, please use VCW as a resource. It's why we're here. Um, we'll be sending out a link to tonight's video. Uh, it'll have com contact information uh, for you to be able to you know, stay in touch with the commission. And thank you all for, for participating tonight and for all you do to improve the lives of women around the state. Good night, everybody.